Today I would like to talk about the history of video game design and how this creative force has bloomed into a multi-billion dollar industry. How one man's vision unwittingly started it all and the highs and lows of this modern day art form. So take my hand and come with me as we dive once more into my deep, deep design pocket and discover more about the history of video game design. Video games have been around for a long time and are now a huge part of the entertainment industry, but they have been around for much, much longer than you may realise. One of the earliest games dates back to 1947, named the Cathay Ray Tube Amusement Device, and was originally inspired by radar display technology used during World War II. The original concept allowed the user to control a vector-drawn dot on a screen to simulate a missile being fired at various targets. This was designed and created by Thomas T. Goldsmith, and you could argue he was one of the first pioneers in game development, unbeknownst to him. In the years that followed, other creative ideas such as noughts and crosses, tennis, and of course Pong, formed the essential game mechanical pillars that still stand today. The ever-popular Call of Duty, for example, still uses that original point-and-shoot design that began in 1940, but layers vast technological improvements improvements and storytelling over the already solid concept to make this experience far more immersive. Fast forward to 1971 and Nolan Bushnell and Ted Dabney designed Computer Space, the first ever coin-operated game sold commercially. It used a display created from a black and white television and was also fairly expensive to make which limited people's exposure to this up and coming form of entertainment. The goal of this developing industry was to make computers and gaming systems more widely available to the masses. Apple, Microsoft and many other businesses were attempting to bring computers into people's homes and gaming software was a big driver towards the popularity of this idea. A few years later there had been so many clones of the game Pong that it played a huge part in the video game crash of 1977. Software had been developed at a massive rate but the technology being used was falling slightly behind, limiting designers capabilities to push the boundaries of what they could do and allowing lazier creatives to mimic previous ideas and cash in. Enter Space Invaders, stage left. A Japanese developer named Taito designed one of the first top-down shooter games and started the beginning of what is now called the golden age of arcade video. This mass market breakthrough paved the way for manufacturers to get to work and target the mainstream. Shopping centres, bowling alleys and dedicated arcades began popping up all over the place, finally giving access to all for the change in your pocket. Now once Tato Space Invaders had set up a licensing deal with Atari, then the world of gaming changed overnight. As well as being able to play arcade games in your local corner shop, you could now play those games at home. You only needed your parents to give you access to the TV and then cough up the readies to get your first home console that actually would mean anything and that was the Atari 2600. I was still a little too young in the 1980s to fully understand that when my cousin started controlling and manipulating the moving images on my nan's television, I marvelled at the witchcraft that was in front of me. The TV had always been a holy place where He-Man and the Flumps lived, and now with the flick of a controller, those images were yours to command. The idea that you had control over moving dots on a screen opened up endless possibilities. I remember picking up the controller and playing for the first time. I was truly crap but it intrigued me nonetheless. As time moved on, thanks to Apple, Microsoft, Acorn and the like, people could now have computers in their home. And those computers were not just word processors anymore. They could create art. They could build moving images. They could program games. My brother and I once spent a long summer coding a cover disc game into an MSX that ultimately ended up looking terrible. A simple driving game where you were a car scrolling up the screen, dodging trees or blocks, whatever. It didn't look anything like it. Failures aside, the possibilities were endless and it was truly was the dawn of computers. No one could ignore that we wanted to be connected to these devices way back then and the future of our jobs and now our social life would come to depend on them heavily in the future. Moving forward slightly, 1983 saw another crash for the gaming industry after market saturation became an issue. Too much product too quickly meant that the mass graves for games were being dug and buried, the most famous of which is the E.T. game of the film, which is one of the worst design games you'll ever see in play. Sadly, Howard Scott Warshaw will be forever remembered for this terrible creation. He was given just five weeks to conceptualise and finish the game of the film, which is an excellent example of Atari's greed at the time and a reference point that all game designers and developers now use on how not to do it. After the crash, thousands of boxes and cartridges of all types of games were buried, only to be exhumed in 2014, and some end up in museums across the globe. The price drop of the huge amount of consoles on the shop floor killed the gaming industry for a while, but shortly afterwards, there of course emerged a new contender, Nintendo. Japan arrived and conquered America, well, sort of. The market share now shifted from the USA to overseas and Nintendo stormed to the top of the console market with the Nintendo Entertainment System, or the NES for short, or the NES. 
This was now the third generation of consoles to become available to the public during the mid to late 80s. They introduced the world of Mario, Donkey Kong and the like and paved the way for many creatives to work with big businesses such as Sony and Microsoft on their own hardware and develop their first party games. Playstations and Xboxes then allowed old stories to be retold and retold better. You now had emerging software that allowed the designers and writers and producers and directors to create almost cinematic gaming experiences. Just one example of the many different genres that the developers can work with in these days. Now I'm not saying that you can compare a film to a game as like for like. One is a two to three hour experience and the other is anything from eight hours to 150 plus hours. But both take an awfully long time to make and require a great deal of craft to complete. Rocksteady's Grand Theft Auto and Konami's Metal Gear Solid are two of those games that have moved the goalposts time and again. Talented individuals appear like giant celebrities now. They write and they direct these complex and intriguing stories. Hideo Kojima through to Hidetaki Miyazaki are the emerging artists of our time and many of the mainstream audiences are unaware of their talent. With this advancement in technology, the storytellers and designers are only inhibited by the breadth of their imagination. The detail that goes into the storyboarding and interface design and character creation and lore etc etc is mind-boggling. Nearly gone except for those hardcore indie developers are the days of one man in an office programming ET. Now we are talking about thousands of employees working thousands of hours to create these epic masterpieces and some of these games still not be very good after that. The marriage of the design and the gaming industry is a constant changing environment. You can have many employees working on the technical aspects of the production but without a clear vision and a simple idea that trickles down from the initial design and creation of the concept, it still may be well doomed to fail. Then you have giant companies that exploit their workers during the latter days of the delivery deadline of the game. I can speak from personal experience as a designer of over 20 years when I say that it's something that is embedded in the culture of the creative industry. You get paid to a certain point and then you do it for the love. The fine line between this is my job and this is my life that has been played on time and time again by employers. Imagine if you told someone who had a 9 to 5 job in retail or a bank they are expected to work an indefinite amount of hours above their usual day and not get paid for it. They'd probably tell you to get stuffed. Creatives on the other hand will always do it for love, apparently. But things are changing. Video games have traditionally always had the same stigma as comic books, that they are essentially for kids but this is something that has changed dramatically over the recent years. It is no accident that the gaming industry is now the largest entertainment industry on the planet and raked in $152 billion in 2019. This completely eclipses Hollywood on a monumental scale. The industry is growing and growing fast which is excellent for the creatives of the world who are able to express themselves on a multitude of levels. PCs, consoles, phones, tablets, they all connect young and old to games in a way that could only be dreamed of several decades ago. Today's game designers have to be more than just a hand on a mouse. You have to think bigger than being just a small cog in the machine and develop your skills to be able to adapt to the ever-shifting sand beneath your feet. Game design is an excellent example of how something so simple back in the 1940s has developed into a multifaceted creative industry that leads from the front. An industry that craves writers, designers, artists, animators, storyboarders, cinematographers and many many other aspects of the arts. It may be the single most unifying force on the planet that pulls together these creative wizards into a collaboration on many different and challenging levels which could ultimately end up with a piece of art that is unlike anything that the world has ever seen. They're also loads of fun. And there you have it, a quick skimp over the history of video game design and a peek through the window of tomorrow. I hope you took away a few golden nuggets of information that will have you saying, <laughs> I just don't care, for the rest of the week. And personally, I'm looking forward to what the future might hold of this fast, growing creative industry but for now as always be good stay safe and be kind to one another <laughs>